and start the broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the case may be. My name is Dave Auda, and I'm going to be your host for this ASQ RD webinar series. This is Chi-Squared Accelerated Reliability Group, CIRG, test, testing methods and applications. Our speaker today will be Alec Feinberg, and this is co-hosted by the Statistics Division, and our co-host today will be Amy Sincroy. I got a couple slides that I'd like to go through before we start the presentation. We have some next sessions coming up. English series on March 12th, you'll see Finding Causes That Checklist Don't Find by Jack Hippel. That's Jack, if you may know, is a trees facilitator, T-R-I-Z, which is an innovative creative problem solving tool. And then on Monday, April 9th, or um, I'm sorry, these these are supposed to be Thursdays. I don't know why they're showing up as Mondays. Apology for that typo. On April 9th, uh, there will be a, Effective Reliability Test Plan Development by Cheryl Tuka from DFR Solutions. The ASQ Statistics Division has some information I'd like to share with you. They have a LinkedIn page, as you can see. You can also view some of their stuff and on their YouTube site, so you can see a glimpse of their YouTube link. And also, today's recorded webinar session will be archived their events and conferences. They also have a list of events that are coming up that you can visit. As you can see, there's a lengthy list of things that are coming up in the immediate future. And then also the 59th Annual Fall Technical Conference is coming up in October, and they have a web link here that you can go and visit that site. Amy, did you want to say anything else about statistics? Um, actually, David, I'm sorry. Uh, I think, I don't know if everyone else is having this problem, but we can only see the cover page. Yeah, on the... Um, yeah, people are saying that they can only see the cover page of oh, the slide deck. Yeah. Let me uh, let me back that up. Okay, there we go. So now you can see the English series. Yeah, it looks like it's changing now. Sorry about that. I'm yes. not sure why that uh, why that lingered like it did. So there's the uh, March 12th. Uh, that's a Thursday, by the way. These are both second Thursday of the month. It's our standard series. I uh, typo on the screen. It's March 12th and April 9th. And here's the uh, screen for the statistics division. And Amy, I wasn't sure if you wanted to say anything else about it. Um, great. No, I, I appreciate the slide, and I, I think everything is well covered here. Um, uh, will the attendees be provided with this uh, information so they can access the links? This should be part of the slide set. Uh, oh. The slide set gets edited afterwards, and I'm not con in control of the editing. It may be taken out, so maybe it's better to say that people should go to asq.org slash statistics. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. We have some need for volunteers, so if you're looking to enhance your leadership skills or if you have a skill you'd like to use in support of the work that we're doing here, feel free to contact the chair at asqrd.org and you'll get a response. During the presentation today, it's a time presentation, so what we'd like you to do is submit your questions in the question panel on your uh, control panel, and I'll pose your questions on, on, on your behalf at the end of the presentation. If for some reason there seems to be something that's compelling and is talking to a slide that uh, Dr. Feinberg is on, I may interrupt, but for all intents and purposes, we'll wait and hold the questions till the end. 2015 Accelerated Stress Testing and Reliability Conference is coming up, and that's going to be in September 9-11, Boston, Mass. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the ASQRD.org and find information there, or you can go to IEEE-ASTR.org and, and view the information directly there. We'd like to thank our friends at Relysoft and Hopsala Card for their support of this English webinar series, which is brought to the community at large at no cost. And today's speaker, of course, is Alec Feinberg, and I'm going to change him to presenter so that he can begin his presentation. Alec, you should have the token. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, thank you, Dave and Amy. Um, so trying to hope that looks okay for everybody. Uh, so I'll just begin and introduce myself a little bit. Um, so we're going to talk about chi-squared accelerated reliability growth model. 
Um, and uh, you can get the slides uh, from ASQ or off uh, the website dfrsoft.com. Um, those are the websites I'm affiliated with. I'm not affiliated with DFR Solutions. Um, a lot of people get me confused because of our name. Uh, and so that's some of the things that I do here, reliability, quality, engineering, software, training, consulting. And there's my contact information. Uh, so the, the reference material for the talk, um, if you go to dfrsoft.com uh, or ASQ, um, uh, look for free videos and publications on, on the DFRsoft website. And under that, <clears throat> uh, it's also a good source. There's a lot of publications there and videos that you might be interested in. They're all free. Um, you'll see, uh, scroll down, you'll look for the slides on that page. And the paper that is associated, the original paper, was published in, um, at RAMS. And you can get it through IEEE Explorer or off the website. Uh, it was published in, in January 2013. But nevertheless, it's a fairly new uh, topic. And um, if you didn't have a chance to go to RAMS or you are exposed to that um, IEEE Explorer, uh, it would be hard to uh, know about uh, chi-squared reliability, accelerated reliability growth. So it's a, it's a good option for you to um, see this talk. <clears throat> and also on that website, uh, you, there's a, a software for it, which you can, um, this, uh, uh, you don't have to buy it. This three weeks download trial, and you can go and um, play with the chi-squared uh, stuff that we're doing today um, and learn about it a little bit better. Uh, and um, I'll show you how to do that when, when it becomes uh, the time. And this is some more information on how you do that. And so <clears throat> here's my bio. Um, founder of DFR Soft, uh, PhD in physics, author of the book Design for Reliability, and I'm principal software developer for the DFR Soft software. Um, I've been around for uh, doing reliability engineering for quite a long time. Uh, in all areas, including solar, thin film, electronics, defense, microelectronics, aerospace, etc. Um, and I've taught classes um, in design for reliability, uh, shock and vibration uh, is a big area for me um, that I teach. Also, uh, quality, accelerated testing, halt, reliability growth, that would we'll be doing somewhat that today, uh, dielectric breakdown, etc. And uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, it's another book that I just worked on, The Physics of Degradation Engineering Materials and Devices. Um, I was a contributing author on Chapter 4 of that, Thermodynamic Damage uh, Within Physics of Degradation. So some, another reference for you if you're interested. So OK, uh, as an overview, um, we'll start off with uh, what is accelerated reliability growth. Uh, we'll talk about fixed effectiveness factor importance of estimating reliability growth, uh, key strengths of CARG, we're going to be using the acronym somewhat, as uh, chi-squared accelerated reliability growth, and um, we'll talk about the model, uh, we'll talk about a uh, case first of the single accelerated stress test, the case of uh, single accelerated stress test with multiple tests, and then with multiple tests and then multiple stress types. Then we're going to look at an application, and we're also going to talk about CARG planning, because in reliability growth, we uh, do planning with a conclusion at the end. So let's look a little, look a bit, little bit about the history of reliability growth. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Duane model. Um, and Duane, um, the original paper is down here referenced, uh, 1964. It's been quite a while. <clears throat> since he was uh, pub published that, I believe his work was on helicopters, and um, he he found that he could obtain a straight line of reliability growth when he plotted MTBF versus uh, test time on a log log uh, paper, and on the linear uh, side of things, uh, it would look like this. Uh, if you linear if you linearize that equation, or it becomes a power law. Um, Rather, if you don't look at the log way, you can uh, put it into a power term. So uh, kind of looks like that. 
and I, I just thought I'd take a poll. Um, if you get a chance, you could do the poll. Uh, there's a, um, let me open that up, the poll, and I'm going to launch that. I have a question, um, which is, are you using or uh, basically, are you now or have you used traditional reliability growth methods? So let me launch the poll. You can just put in um, your response, and um, I'll see. I'll share that with everybody, and um, so people are filling that out now. I see we have a good portion. It looks like somewhere around 60-40 of uh, people have uh, actually um, have some familiarity with, or actually it's getting closer to 50-50. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> so reliability is kind of a popular top. Uh, reliability growth in itself is a popular topic. So this is a, a, a nice extension of, of your knowledge for that. So um, <clears throat> you're probably familiar with a lot. Of, half of you are familiar with the Duane model, um, and maybe this is the first time you're exposed to this. Okay, so um, now in the equation of when you when you fit a straight line to that, the slope is sorry, kind of sorry interesting. To interrupt, sorry to interrupt, Alex, but you yeah. need to close the poll. I did. Oh, I didn't close it. Okay. okay. All right. So we ended up with about uh, fi oh, close to fifty-fifty, with uh, six percent not familiar with uh, reliability growth. Okay, so I close that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, on the plot, you'll notice the slope is kind of interesting, and let's look at that. Um, so the, in the Duane theory of things, um, he kind of rationalized that the slope, uh, newly introduced systems have a time to maturity based on the alpha of slope, which is uh, related to the uh, if, uh, the effort that's put into the program for reliability growth. If you have a very low slope, a little effort put into the reliability, you're not getting much reliability growth, where some number like 0.6, a little bit more ambitious, uh, pro much more ambitious program, much more reliability growth. And associated with the, uh, over the years, um, is the cornerstone of reliability growth, which is now uh, test, analyze, and fix. People call that TAF, T-A-A-F. And, um, and when we do, uh, Duane mostly did work in the, on field data, but nowadays a, a lot of our testing is in the lab. And uh, so we test, analyze, and fix. Uh, and when you do HALT, for example, that's a very good example of test, analyze, and fix kind of methodology, so you are doing reliability growth uh, if you, which, uh, when you do something like that or some sort of accelerated testing and you're improving your design. So accelerated testing, we typically, um, well, that's why one of our goals for that. So what is the concept of uh, accelerate, accelerated reliability growth? Well, we want to improve or grow our reliability. And in order to do that, you have to find and fix failure modes. So finding failure modes is a good thing. It creates opportunities for design improvements. And in order to find a hidden stress uh, in a shorter time, you have to stress it. So to accelerate this process, we usually raise the level of the stress. So that's kind of uh, the basic concepts for accelerated reliability growth. Now, I'd like to talk, we're going to be using a concept of fixed effectiveness in the, in the card model. And so I'd like to introduce that. Um, there's two kinds of failure modes. There's A and B. Uh, that's kind of a traditional way of thinking about things in reliability growth, where A modes are uh, fixes cannot be assigned, where the B modes fixes can be assigned. And generally speaking, we, we usually find that about 95% of potential failure modes can be assigned fixes or corrective actions. So in this case, um, we can estimate the fixed effectiveness factor. And how do we do that? Uh, if we, um, if the 
fixed effectiveness factor is about 70%, uh, rather we can estimate how much a product can be improved by. So products can be improved by about 65.5%. And, and that's if we take these two numbers and we multiply them together, the 95 and the 70, we come up with a fixed effectiveness factor of 0.665. So that generally um, means you can grow your reliability by a factor of three. So when you do halt, you may not know, for example, um, your MTBF uh, improvement, but if you have some idea of your MTBF in the initially, you could say, well, I've maybe improved it by a factor of three. So it's kind of a nice um, rule of thumb that I, I tell people uh, when they do testing and they don't have any uh, idea what their reliability growth is when they're finding and fixing failure modes. That's uh, a pretty good rule of thumb, I think. And um, <clears throat> if you have any input to that, you can ask the questions um, later, I guess. Uh, we're asking questions at the end. Now, the fixed effectiveness factor, the 70%, if we were to retest and and we had conclusiveness in our testing, then the fixed effectiveness factor, which I'm going to be calling F, is going to be equal to 1, which means we're 100% certain that we fixed it and we're not causing any other problems and the failure mode that we fixed is, um, is, uh, is you know, it's, it's over and done with that. We won't see any more of that type of failure mode. So that gives you an idea of what the, what the fixed effectiveness factor means. Now, we asked the question, um, why and how do I quantify reliability growth? So it's important. Reliability growth is kind of important. Uh, we can justify um, expensive reliability testing. We can provide failure rate estimates with new fixes in place. We can play what if games if uh, how to, uh, estimates on um, <coughs> on our AFR improvement. Uh, we, we can say, well, what if we didn't fix it versus what if we did? What is my test growth achieved? What is my growth for all the tests combined with the fixes? Um, and how do I work in my acceleration factors and my confidence levels? Uh, so these are some of the questions and uh, things that are good about reliability growth as well as some of the questions. And one of the things that we're going to say is that the CARG model provides uh, good estimates for um, all these questions. So it's a, it, it's a pretty good model. And I think um, it has a lot of value. Um, I know of a number of companies that are now using it. Uh, and uh, so If you're using Duane or CROAMSA, there's some shortcomings in their models. The growth assessment to zero failure tests results is problematic for the models. Um, statistical significance is uh, not really intrinsic to the models. The models don't lend themselves easily to multi-growth test analysis. And uh, CARG overcomes a lot of these issues quite easily, and you'll see that. So uh, there's some, it's, it's a, intuitive because a lot of us use uh, chi-squared method for estimating things in, in, um, on when we do accelerated testing. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, key accelerated tests that we might be looking at, um, high temperature operating life, uh, temperature cycle, vibration, temperature humidity, these are all things that we could use um, and uh, uh, some ideas, these are HAST and HALT, we typically don't, we're not really kind of looking at that because um, in that case we would not be able, and typically in HALT we can't really quantify the MTBF improvement um, except for that rule of thumb I gave you. <clears throat> but in these tests uh, often we can if we have a reasonable sample size and we, we can estimate our fixed effectiveness and uh, there's going to be uh, some information on that. I didn't really address on the statistics that the chi-squared model is, you know, it's kind of based on the Poisson process. It's an exponential kind of thing. Um, so uh, chi-squared statistics, um, wherever you're from, typically what happens when we do accelerated testing 
if we're not doing like test to failure, like a, a Weibull analysis or something like that, a lot of times we don't have many failures. And in that case, we really don't know what distribution we're using. And if we don't have a lot of failures, it's probably exponential. So this is kind of the strength of the card model, and it works in this area. Now, if you do have a lot of failures, it doesn't mean you can't use the card model. And I'll show you how that is uh, when we uh, look at the software and how we can get around that a little bit. Okay, so here's the chi-squared. and. Uh, just so you understand when we talk about the model, the terminology and how, how we're doing that. So uh, when we look at the failure rate uh, and we're, we're looking at a chi-squared model for uh, estimating the failure rate for testing, uh, it's really a function of um, the chi-squared statistic, which is a function of the confidence level and the number of failures uh, and the in the model, uh, the chi-squared equation, the sample size, the acceleration factor, and the test time. So this is the argument, and we're going to be kind of working in that format because it's a concise uh, format. We don't really need the full equation. Yeah, it's hard to uh, cumbersome to use. So uh, the case for the single accelerated stress test. So this is the simplest case, and so working on this form format and extending it a little bit with uh, subscripts and superscripts now. So the, um, the uh, subscripts are going to be for the test number, where the superscript is for the stress type. So because this is a single accelerated stress type, there's only one type of stress. So the uh, reliability growth that we would achieve is we would uh, we have an initial estimate for the failure rate we've tested, um, we found failures, and we can estimate the failure rate. We have a sample size, we have an acceleration factor, we have a test time, and we estimate what we've achieved. Now we go ahead and we fix our design, and so uh, we may not have time to retest, which you know ha happens in industry quite a bit because we're in a rush and we go on to the next durability test or we may add sample sizes and things like that. So in the final analysis, we, we multiply it by the fixed effectiveness factor times the, the failures that we achieved. So in this sense, without retesting, we can estimate the reliability growth that we've achieved. So that's basically how this works. Uh, and <clears throat> it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, your initial minus your final is your, uh, is, your, is your growth factor. Now, if you retest, then, of course, uh, your f is equal to 1 because we have assurance, and uh, our y might equal 0 in this case. So uh, we wouldn't have a need for chi-squared reliability growth in that instance. So this is primarily when you don't have time to retest. Okay, so um, now let's look at the case of a single accelerated stress type with multiple tests. So we have the same stress type. Uh, so uh, S is still equal to 1. We Remember we called the uh, superscript the stress type. So we're basically uh, keep that 1, but now the bottom uh, guy, the subscript, is the test number. We have a lot of different tests going on of the same stress type. We can now look at the contributions from all the different tests that we keep doing um, as we, you know, we fix our design or we, and we are ongoing or we may have a, a very similar, we, we have other similar products that, we're, that are, um, so you might have design A, B, and C, but they're very similar design and you have to test each one. So, uh, with the same stress, and um, uh, you may feel justified in, in uh, being able to use this uh, test method uh, for uh, alternate, somewhat alternate but similar design methods, um, estimating that your failure modes won't change that much. So in this case, we have to sum up over the number of stresses that we're doing and um, the failures that we achieved. 
uh, for that. And this is the notation uh, that is used in the paper for that. And we're summing up over the test uh, stress, uh, the, the test groups. Now finally, we would have a case where we have multiple accelerated stress types with multiple tests. So uh, we have multiple t-test groups and a number of different um, types of accelerated stress tests. So the total reliability achieved uh, can be done in this way. Now one thing to keep in mind um, is the notation is a little cumbersome, but it's very succinct. Uh, so what are we doing here? We're really, we're really looking at device hours. So uh, keep that in mind. You can, uh, you can add device hours amongst different tests. So that would be the way you would handle this or would, the way you would think of all this, um, uh, it, what this notation is doing. So it's really not that difficult to see what, what's going on. So now we can have multiple tests. We can, so this, this sing, uh, single test, we might have a lot of uh, stress tests, say temperature testing. So this might all represent one uh, type of te temperature stress test. And um, could be different temperatures, but basically um, we can estimate our acceleration factor amongst the temperatures and things like that. And I'll show you that in a little bit. And we might have different test times and different sample sizes. So chi-squared can handle all that, the, uh, this method. Now, we may, in this area, we're having different tests. So we might have a humidity test, temperature humidity testing. We might have a, just a, a temperature test, high temperature operating life test. And we might have a vibration test uh, or a temperature cycle test. Uh, so we can now look at all those tests that are occurring and the reliability growth for each test and also the total results for all tests. Now we want to keep uh, sites of uh, the, um, the we, we're, we're still, uh, in a sense, whenever we do reliability growth, we we're basically have a, a plot where we are having um, a situation where we have an MTBF growth. And for, to that end, uh, it's still, um, when we put it on a, a plot, uh, and it doesn't matter where it comes from, we see the growth, we still basically can think of it as a Duane model. So we can still uh, find the slope and we can still uh, estimate the beta just like uh, Duane has, uh, just like in the Duane model and uh, estimate the alpha and things of that nature. And uh, so we are able to, in, we are able to correlate it to our historical knowledge of our reliability growth that we may have known from the past. So we're not throwing away reliability growth. We're not coming up with a new model that uh, chucks the Duane model or anything like that. We're, we want to keep within the framework uh, of traditional reliability growth. Uh, it's just to know, uh, but the concept of being able to estimate the fixed effectiveness factor uh, so we don't have to retest uh, and, and estimate our reliability growth and uh, try to rationalize to our manager our value as reliability engineers, uh, the growth that we, the MTBF growth that we've achieved. Um, and, and once we know the growth that we've achieved, we can put a dollar value on it. Uh, from an MTBF point of view, I have some sl a slide or so on that later. And I think it's important um, as reliability um, engineers that we quantify our testing results in some way, shape, or form and justify our existence when we're doing accelerated testing to demonstrate um, that we are achieving um, and improving the product and saving the company a lot of money. So this becomes a very valuable tool. Uh, it's very easy to use. We're, friend we're familiar with it. So let's look at an example of electronic assembly. Uh, so, and not really hypothetical, it's a consulting job that I worked on. And uh, in this case, we had a humidity group. And these were the sample sizes of the different humidity groups that, were, uh, that came through um, that was being tested. Uh, the test time was very short, 100 hours. Uh, the acceleration factor for that and the number of failures found. Not a lot of failures found in this group. Um, there were two, in, in, uh, two failures observed in group two. 
So we had a, set, uh, a test summary here. Um, and the way that I typically handle, uh, if you have different acceleration factors, if you, you could uh, use different test times as well and, um, as, uh, and things like that. And in theory, you can use different acceleration factors and you can summarize that. Um, what I do is recommend taking an average. Uh, you could do a worst case by taking the lowest acceleration factor if you wanted. So there's just some options there when you're doing the summary. A uh, temperature shock example, um, CARD can handle that. Uh, you have your sample size and that was done and the test time. Uh, typically, um, now uh, this is really just 10 cycles that was done on the product because even though it's 240 hours, um, we could, uh, in this particular instance, um, 20, 24 hours a day was equal to one cycle. So 10 cycles is 240 hours. So you have to keep in mind you want to keep hours consistent. And here's the acceleration factor for that test and the number of failures, just a few more for each one that occurred. Most of the uh, failures that were occurring were in vibration. Uh, so here's the sample size that was tested uh, in vibration and the test time uh, 18 hours on test and it was a very high acceleration factor. And the number that uh, failed. So um, in, in, in this instance now, we're, we're kind of theoretical here. So, uh, but in this, in the simple case where we had four failures and 75% fixed effectiveness factor, that would mean that we would expect or we would grow the reliability from four failures to one failure. So we would expect that if we did this uh, for this group here uh, and uh, we would and retested, uh, we might only find one failure. So you get an idea of what that means. But when you start taking numbers less than four or five, you start getting fractions. And of course, you can do that because it's a theoretical kind of uh, method when you're doing chi-squared reliability growth. You can take fractional results. So here's the all test summary on the number of samples and the total test times that was done and uh, total failed um, and the average fixed effectiveness factor that was used for each test. So let me um, show you, here's the input sheet for that. So let me just go to the software for a minute and you get a better feel for a little bit of how this works. So uh, if you do use the uh, DFR soft tool, uh, so uh, you open it up and it looks kind of like this and you go to the reliability tools and you scroll down looking for the reliability growth. Um, so um, uh, sorry, that's the software reliability growth. Um, so, okay, here we are, module 10. And you can um, you can go over to the it's just like a Excel is laid out it's very similar uh, type of format and you can go to module 10 there. Um, so uh, here's uh, not exactly the same this is a little bit different uh, test that was done but you get the idea um, where we uh, zoom in a little bit here. And we have our sample size, the test time, the acceleration factor, the number that failed, and the fixed effectiveness factor. Now, uh, when we have a lot of failures, like 6 out of uh, 25, well, why is that exponential? So how do we get around that? And uh, in this particular software, what we're using is the point estimate for the initial um, value for the failure rate. If uh, DFR soft detects uh, greater than 10% uh, a failure rate, let me just, um, the directions are over here for using that, there's pop-up directions and there's also a video, uh, if you hyperlink, if you uh, click on this it brings you to the video, uh, it, uh, similar to the video you might find today, uh, but a little more directed to this if you were trying to use this. Uh, I think it's a good thing, even if you're not interested in the software, to be familiar with it. You can lay it out yourself if you want. Um, and uh, but the, the software will help you to become familiar with how to use it and the limitations and things like that. So what DFR soft does is um, it provides you with a point estimate if it's higher than 10% of the population that um, 
has uh, failed. So uh, you can override that if you want by putting a 1 here. It'll just use the chi-square statistic uh, and the default uh, kind of thing uh, for the point estimate. And what it does is the um, initially um, it uses the point estimate, but the fixed effectiveness factor is assumed to be less than 10%. So uh, that's where the chi-squared statistic would come in for a large number of failures. So uh, that's how we handle um, getting around the fact that it may not be an exponential distribution when we have a lot of failures. But when we do our fixes, at that point, we're, we're going to see few failures. And we're probably uh, more likely to be that. And here's the second test group, humidity, uh, vibration. There's the options for that, three tests uh, on, on that. Uh, and uh, there's the process of the initial, uh, it works in MTBF and FITS and AFR, so you can see your initial and your final. And you can see the reliability growth for each test uh, that is done um, uh, throughout that. So you, get, you can have a reliability growth for each test, uh, as well as a summary. So you can summarize that. Uh, so here's the reliability growth for the, um, the, the, the pink line is the temperature shock test. The blue line, this is an AFR, so this would be percentage. Uh, the, the AFR grew from about 29% failure all the way uh, improved to about 9% uh, failure uh, the, uh, for the total. That's the total full summary. Uh, and the pink line um, temperature shock improved from about uh, 17 percent down to 5 percent. There's also an MTBF graph. It's a little harder to read because it, this kind of throws off the scale because vibration had a lot of failures. But the AFR is a little bit easier to see. Here's the vibration uh, summary there and the uh, blue is the humidity test. And uh, here is your, al your growth alphas if you're interested in um, uh, assessing this in terms of the Duane model for the four, uh, the all test summary as well, well as that. So you, you'll uh, get an opportunity to uh, play with that if you do that free download. Okay, so uh, going back, um, we have that input sheet. And um, so now the advantage just going back uh, using a fixed effectiveness estimation factor which you know you can change. Uh, you can change that here uh, by you know if you don't feel comfortable with 75%, you think it's less, or you have more uh, confidence, and you you think it's 90% certain that you fix that. You could use that. Uh, so in, we recommend the 75% uh, number. Um, <clears throat> often we do not have uh, time to retest the fix uh, that was implemented. Um, it allows us to estimate the growth with, uh, with the fix. It's the only uh, reliable growth method for multi-test capabilities that can effectively incorporate accelerated factors and fix of effectiveness. I think it's one of the better methods. I mean, there, as far as I know, it's the only method for doing multi-method accelerated testing uh, easily. <clears throat> uh, so. There's the individual test that we sh I showed you um, for each test, the reliability growth in terms of the MTBF achieved for each one with the fixed effectiveness factor. And again, the summary of the growth alphas uh, that I, show, I, I mentioned to you for each one and the overall growth alpha uh, was achieved was 0.13. You can see that vibration had 0.3. Uh, so it had a bigger slope. There was more failures found uh, in, in that case. Uh, we were able to assess the growth for each test as a summary of all the tests that were done, as well as um, a full summary for that. Now, this might not make sense to you. Let me, let me uh, explain a little bit. Let's say that, that uh, in, in a sense, if we're doing chi-squared reliability growth testing, we have find, you know you can add failure rates. So if we talk in terms of fits, for example, let's say one test we were able to grow it to 100 fits, another test we were able to grow it to 50 fits, the total fits you could add, you always can add up 
uh, the failure rate. So in that sense, we would be uh, saying that the actual uh, product was now at 150 fits for the two tests. Okay, so uh, combined here, we have the uh, confidence levels. Um, here's the, here's the, each test and uh, the initial failure, the initial AFR and the final AFR. It's done in terms of AFR, so a little bit easier to read. Um, and the growth alphas that were achieved uh, for each test, uh, so we can look at that as well. And I did it for at the 60 and the 90 percent level confidence level. For that, you can see the difference in what was assessed uh, for that. So you can play around with that as well. Now, um, you can estimate uh, your net worth as, uh, in terms of what you how you improve the product uh, and the savings to your manager. Let's say the cost for unit is uh, $35 and the initial AFR is 23.7. Um, uh, no growth uh, in the product would be uh, per thousand units would be, uh, say if we're doing the 90%, would be $8,000 of, um, of loss. And uh, if we improve the growth uh, to down uh, from 23% to 12%, we've now lessened the loss to $4,000 uh, or uh, cost per savings um, uh, around that value. Not sure why I have two numbers here. Growth warranty loss. Uh, I guess one's a warranty loss. Slightly different. Okay, so it gives you an estimate for uh, to to present to your manager uh, the savings that your lab is doing uh, for your testing. Now, uh, one other thing you can do with the chi squared method is you can do chi squared planning. Um, so, if you want to, if you have a, start to get an estimate for your beta uh, for your testing, uh, you can estimate with your initial uh, test how much you can grow your reliability over time and uh, using that. So with a slight modification um, with a fixed effectiveness factor. So that's uh, how I would go about that. So uh, in conclusion, um, we showed you a, a new model was developed called CARG, Chi-Squared Accelerated Reliability Growth. It offers a new way to estimate reliability growth for the industry in, in the uh, popular area of Chi-Squared Accelerated Testing. It is, it is uh, probably the only reliability growth method that is easily lends itself to multi-stress uh, test situations. It can handle growth to zero failures. Uh, confidence is intrinsic in the model. It uses fixed effectiveness factor so the test verification is not required for estimates. So that's uh, basically the uh, conclusions. And um, I think we're able to take um, questions now. Yes, Alec, we have a couple of questions that are posted. One of them from Thomas is, do I need to have, a, in the case of accelerated stress type in multiple tests, a failure in each test to estimate the reliability growth? Well, I think if you have zero failures, uh, you'll, um, let me just go back to the software for a second because it had that, uh, some of those cases. Uh, let me just, uh, let's see, we can see that we had uh, zero failures initial, let's go down to number failed, well, let's put in zero here. So you can see the straight line here, so you don't get any growth. If you see zero failures, you're not going to get uh, any estimate for your growth. So uh, where the other ones are, are, you can estimate with your fixed effectiveness factor. So I think the, the, the concept is that you're, um, you have three, uh, say you had a 75% fixed effectiveness factor um, and you had six failures. You, you would expect to, to grow it from six, uh, six failures down to 1.5, and that's where we get our estimate for our reliability growth. 
but if you have zero failures found, uh, you would not see any uh, number expected here uh, improvement. So the answer is you you uh, in uh, not for that particular for that particular test you can't really estimate your your reliability is as good as it's going to get for that test if you have zero failures. Okay, great, thanks. The next question is actually there's a couple of questions that are asking about how do you determine the acceleration factor. Uh, so the the acceleration factor is is um, is for the the the, te the test that you would be doing you would the typical answer for that is to use historical models uh, for example um, let me just on the software uh, there there are a number of historical models sorry I'm referring to the software but um, it's easier to do it to show that. Um, uh, so, on the on the um, acceleration factors, you can uh, the, there's historical models for uh, Rainius, for example, if you're doing temperature for temperature humidity. Uh, there's typical models, and actually the models are um, you can we hyperlink to those models. Um, see. So these are some of the models that are typical. Here's the Arrhenius model for temperature testing. Um, uh, this is uh, the um, temperature cycle model, Coffin-Manson model. Uh, this is the modified Coffin-Manson model. Uh, there is um, high temperature operating life. Uh, let's, let's rally. This one here is the vibration model, um, as well as uh, so. Those are some of the popular models uh, that are used in chi-squared estimation. Um, does that answer your question? And uh, well, I mean, I'm sorry. We'll have, we'll, have, we'll have to wait for a response from from our attendee. Uh, Tom's did follow up with another question uh, relative to the zero failures. He wanted to know if that Im implies that there's reliability growth. If you have zero failures, uh, it, it implies that you're very successful in your test and that you. Uh, um, it, it means what you've achieved is um, not reliability growth, but what you've achieved is you, you can estimate a number on your failure rate or your MTBF so you can tell your, you know, if you're saying to your boss, well, I got zero failures, but um, uh, I can estimate the reliability. I can estimate the MTBF. We did the test. We put 50 got, units on test. We got zero failures. Uh, we tested for a thousand hours. Um, I know what my device hours are. I know I had zero failures using the chi-squared statistic. You can estimate that the failure rate is whatever it ends up being uh, using your accelerated model um, and the chi-squared method, um, which would be uh, uh, so. For example, um, here's a test plan. Uh, if I did. Um, uh, if I had tested 100 uh, devices, um, we look at the the failure rate analysis one. Here's the failure rate. So if I have a test time of, of 1,000 hours, for example, and uh, I have a sample size of 100 units, and I know my acceleration factor from one of my models, let's say it's 50, uh, at, and I got zero failures, you could tell your boss that uh, your MTBF that you are 90% confident that the MTBF is um, to let me wrote, zoom in on that one two three uh, looks like on uh, this case it's um, make a little smaller sample size it doesn't look really realistic okay so about uh, 600 and 650,000 hours for example with this particular test 650,000 hours. So you could say I'm 90% confident that our that the failure rate is um, is no worse than 650,000 hours is what you would say. If you had one failure, you would be able to achieve reliability growth because you would you could you could estimate uh, from that uh, some growth. Let's say I had two failures or four failures. So this is basically what you're doing. You have four failures. You start off with an MTBF of um, 187,000, 
and you go down to 75% fixed effectiveness, which means you'd have one failure at the end, which would mean you'd basically have 385,000 hours. So you've grown your reliability from the four failure to the one failure. So that's basically what you're doing with the chi-squared method and the fixed effectiveness factor. Great. Thanks, Alec. We'll see if another question comes back on that one. There were a couple of questions on how to calculate or estimate the fixed effectiveness factor. Um, well, there there is no good way. It, it's not a calcul calculatable kind of number. It's a historical number. Uh, people, um, it's an engineering confidence type of number. I, you, it's sort of like how confident are you that you, you fixed your product and not caused another failure to occur or that the failure mode uh, will not reoccur. So typically 75% uh, is conservative or 70% is conservative. Um, and But in some instances, you may be 100% confident. So then you would put in 100% confidence. In this case, you would uh, go from four failures uh, so you'd have that 187,000 MTBF down to zero failures, uh, which would be 650,000 hours. So that would be your maximum achievable chi-squared number with 90% confidence. You have 90% confidence that your MTBF is no worse than 650,000 hours. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question here. Define the level of effort used, alpha, in growth testing. What is little and what is ambitious? Well, I don't have that historical uh, knowledge because uh, when we talk about accelerated testing, uh, it would be more related to your product. Um, and you would have to start becoming familiar with your testing situation, um, I believe. Um, now, um, so when I, I was sort of led to believe uh, when I started learning about reliability growth that point 0.1 was very little effort and point 0.3 or point 0.4 was very typical for an ambitious effort. Um, so what I saw with uh, the consulting work that I did, um, the kinds of uh, alphas that I was getting was um, uh, point 0.1 and vibration where I had a lot of failures I got point 0.3. So um, I mean when you do an accelerated testing, I think that's an ambitious effort. And um, you need to find failures. If you're not finding much in the way of failures, you're not going to get much growth anyway. Um, but if you have a reasonable number of failures, you will get a lot more growth. Uh, so I would say uh, 0.3 seems to be something that I came up with. Um, I don't really have all the historical numbers because accelerated testing is somewhat of a different animal than uh, field testing, which Duane did, and a lot of the historical numbers that were published. Okay, thanks. Another question, will the Excel spreadsheet be available? Yes, um, so you would just go to the, my web, the website, DFRsoft, and you, you do the free download. Uh, it's a three-week trial period, and you can play with it. You don't have to buy the software. Uh, and uh, you can play with it as much as you want for the three weeks, and um, you can make up your own spreadsheet, or you, you know, hope, if you're interested, you could buy the software. It's very low priced and it has a lot of stuff in it. It's like three or four hundred dollars, depending upon what version you buy. Um, Great, and it has a lot of tools, you know, liable plotting and everything. Mm -hmm. Another question: Have the AMSA models been assessed for ability to incorporate stress acceleration? Um, yes, if uh, we just go to the software, um, I've worked with that. The Crow AMSA model, uh, I have that on the spreadsheet as well. Let me go zoom out so I can find it. I believe it's module 10. Let's, let's go to module, sorry. Okay, so it's on module 10. Uh, if I scroll down, there is a Crow AMSA model for that. There's, uh, um, and uh, it gives you the Duane model and the um, also the Crow Amser results down below. So you can play with that as well. It's on the same spreadsheet. 
uh, and you can play with that. But what I found uh, with the best that I could do with it was the test order mattered uh, and things like that. Where in the chi-squared situation, test order doesn't matter the way that you put it in. Uh, and which, which is part of the reason that I, I came up with the chi-squared method was that the awkwardness of it and the inability to work with zero failures and things like that. Great. Thanks, Dan. Another question. Uh, what does the confidence level mean? Um, well, when you're talking about confidence um, in the chi-squared model, uh, say, um, say you have an MTBF Say, you're not, say you put in the 90% confidence here, or 60% confidence. Now, the results um, is, uh, in terms of MTBF, the total results uh, on, on that, I'll test summary, let me zoom in. Let's say uh, I have a final MTBF of uh, for the all test summary of uh, um, in this case it was um, ninety four uh, thousand hours, so uh, close to one hundred thousand hours. So what that means is that I am um, sixty percent confident that my MTBF is no worse than not, uh, roughly 100,000 hours, uh, which means that in terms of testing, if I retested six out of uh, 10 times, I would find in, uh, my MTBF was no worse than uh, 900 and, uh, close to 100,000 hours. Now, if I change that to 90% confident, it's going to get um, and go back down. I know I have the summary somewhere else, but final uh, MTBF, 63,000 hours, which means that if I tested nine times out of 10, I would find that my failure rate is no worse than 63,000 hour MTBF. Um, so that I would, uh, in, or my failure rate in fits was no higher than, um, in this case, I had uh, 1,500 fits. In ter if you're talking in terms of failure rate. So I would not expect uh, this would be the maximum failure rate or the minimum MTBF that I would see uh, if I retested 9 out of 10 times. So if you're using 90% confidence, you can think of it as that you would get that results by retesting 9 out of 10 times. Or if you're using 60% confidence, it would be 6 out of 10 times. Does that answer the question? We'll, we'll see if that question comes back to us. So another question here is, if I have six failures out of a population of 25 devices in an accelerated test, I would assume that I see a kind of a wear out if the failure mode of all six devices is the same or similar. I would calculate whether the two-parameter viable distribution, a beta, greater, equal, or greater than one. So the question is, why should I assume an exponential distribution? Right. So you, in that case, you wouldn't. but. Uh, you would have to come up with a method for assessing your reliability growth. But you could also use a point estimate, which is what is done here. Um, although it's not the best way to do it, if you have a, a Weibull uh, method and all your failure modes are the same, you certainly can welcome to use the Weibull method. Um, and you can, what, uh, um, you would have to estimate uh, at that time, you would not be easily able to say, okay, well, I've improved it down to, from six failures, I have 75% fixed effectiveness factor. How do I plot that on a Weibull plot? That's what I would ask. Uh, so I would be down, let's say in this case, six failures, I would be down to 1.5 failures. How would I plot that on the Weibull plot? Would I assume the same beta? You could try to do that and you could estimate your MTBF growth that way. So you could handle it in that sense. I think that would be a very good way of doing it. Um, if you wanted to use the chi-squared model, uh, all that is used here is the point estimate. It defaults to the point estimate once I get more than 10% failure. Uh, DFRsoft knows that um, maybe it's a Weibull distribution or something like that. But on the other hand, what if it's not all the same failure modes? What if there are different failure modes? What if some of them are mechanical and some of them electrical and uh, of that nature? 
So you have a mixed mode. You can't really do WIBO analysis on that. But you can do a point estimate. You can always do a point estimate um, in that sense. And that's why the chi-squared method um, with your fixed effectiveness factor, once you're down to 1.5 failures, you can say, well, it's 1.5 out of 25. Uh, at this point, I've improved my product so much that it's an exponential distribution now. So that's where the strength of it would come in. So there are some abilities to use. I'm not saying you shouldn't use a Weibull method, but I'm saying that you have to be keep abreast of the situation of what you would have to do to uh, come up with your new MTBF. You could use a Bayesian method in that case by assuming the same um, beta uh, and say that a down to 1.5 fixes. So that would be a very one alternative. In that case, if you have all the same type of failure modes, if you don't have all the same type of failure modes, then you're then this is another option, the chi-squared method. Okay, another question: Does this model work with small sample sizes less than five? Um, well, the model is very good for that because uh, what happens is you end up with five samples, and then you do maybe three samples later and two samples. Um, you know, you know, in two months later, more products become available that you can get, and you can you can add up and accumulate your device hours. So, in a sense, uh, five samples is not a great sample size um, if you have a high enough acceleration factor, uh, and you're if you're finding failures, you know, um, typically you don't have a lot of confidence when you have five failures and you have zero failures, or you have five failures and you have one failure. You know, you can estimate your reliability growth with that, but it's um, not optimal. But what becomes optimal is when you can start collectively looking at more and more samples over time, because you may only be able to test five um, in, in, you know, in December, uh, but come uh, January, February, or March, the next year you might get four more. Uh, in the meantime, you start to be able to build up a number of test groups uh, and because you have all these test groups, at that point you are able to make a better assessment of what's happening in the going to happen in the field. So I hope that addresses it somewhat. Yes, I see that we've uh, hit the hour, so we're for a minute after we're going to have to stop here. There are several more questions, and so we will forward those to you, Dr. Feinberg, and you can answer those at your leisure. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, everybody attending, and um, it was my pleasure to help you out, and, uh, uh, um, and have a nice day. Thanks, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Statistics and Reliability Division and on behalf of our audience for your presentation today. I hope that you'll come back and do another one with us in the future. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. We'll shut Thanks. down. Okay.